Well, we're going to be talking about Joshua chapter 2. That's the account of Rahab. And uh, this is the story of how somebody who had everything against them, apparently, actually is brought into God's purpose. And that no matter how bad and dumb you think your situation is, how locked in you are, how limited you are by the ties that bind, God will still be there for you, and God knows his people, and he has a plan to save you. Simple as that. So let's uh, let's start with a prayer, and uh, I'll try and remember your prayer requests. And uh, of course, we're here to focus upon the Lord Jesus. And the way we're going to do that through Rahab is with this thing about the scarlet rope or the scarlet cord that she had in her window, but we'll come to that. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you to thank you from the bottom of our hearts that you reach out to save people from the most incredibly <clears throat> difficult and tied in, closed situations. And we pray that you will help us to believe that for ourselves. And we pray, Father, that we might be able to play some small part in the lives of other people in helping them <clears throat> to you, to come into the midst of Israel, into the midst of your people. Pray you'll be with Gina in the Bible study and uh, help us all not to be phased by the smaller issues, but to see the simple overall truth of your word <clears throat> and of your dear son. We pray, Father, for the work that's going on with the Iranians, <clears throat> for those that Evie and I hope to baptize today, that that will work out. And we pray for those of them who are depressed. And we pray that you'll you'll help all of us to be able to look through and beyond the limitations that it seems we are stuck in, and to see that there is, in fact, a far greater and bigger picture. We pray for Emmy in her witness to that dentist and in her witness there in Indonesia, and for her and Mark and Lisa to have a good meeting and to encourage each other. We pray for Dan Mui with all her family, that <clears throat> you'll help her with all that stress and help somehow out of all that help good to come so that some may come to you and to your dear son we pray you be with john and with his mum and uh, that you'll calm her and uh, cure her and help her and bless her we ask father that <clears throat> we might all as phil said get that sense that of our own on one hand insignificance and yet on the other hand our huge meaning to you because of the work of the lord jesus so, Father, we we pray that you will open our eyes now to the account of, of Rahab and that we might see ourselves in that woman and feel again your grace. For the Lord's sake. Amen. Right. Well, I want us to read uh, Joshua chapter 2, which is the account of Rahab. And I wonder, would somebody like to read Joshua chapter 2 for us? All the silence. Nobody, uh, nobody went to school. Oh, nobody okay. has heard a read. I read. Oh, did you finish school? Okay, you can read. The others didn't want to read. Okay, great. Somebody can read. That's great. Joshua two. <clears throat> Joshua, the son of Nun, secretly sent two men out of Shittim as spies, saying, "Go view the land, including Jericho." They went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and slept there. The king of Jericho was told, Behold, men of the children of Israel came in here tonight to spy out the land. The king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered into your house, for they have come to spy out all the land. The woman took the two men and concealed them. Then she said, Yes. The men came to me, but I don't know where they came from. It happened about the time of the shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Where the men went, I don't know. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them under the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. The men pursued them the way to the Jordan to the forts. As soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. Before they had lain down, she came up to them on the roof and she said to the men, 
I know that Yahweh has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how Yahweh dried up the waters of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. As soon as we have heard it, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more spirit in any man because of you. For Yahweh, your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now, therefore, please swear to me by Yahweh, since I have dealt kindly with you, that you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a true token. Please save alive my father, my mother, my brothers and my sisters, and all that they have, and will deliver our lives from death. The man said to her, Our life for yours, if you don't talk about this business of ours, and it shall be when Yahweh gives us the land, that we will deal kindly and truly with you. Then she let them down by a court through the window, for her house was on the side of the wall, and she lived on the wall. She said to them, Go to the mountain, lest the pursuers find you, and hide yourselves there three days, until the pursuers have returned. Afterward, you may go on your way. The man said to her, We will be guiltless of this, your oath, which you have made us to swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall bind the line of scarlet thread in the window which you used to let us down. You shall gather to yourself into the house of your father, your mother, your brothers and all your father's household. It shall be that whoever goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood will be on his head, and we will be guiltless. Whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head, if any hand is on him. But if you talk about this business of ours, then we shall be guiltless of your oath which you have made us to swear. She said, according to your words, so be. She sent them away and they departed. She tied the scarlet line in the window. They left and came to the mountain and stayed there three days until the pursuers had returned. The pursuers sought them throughout all the way, but didn't find them. Then the two men returned descended from the mountain, passed over, and came to Joshua, the son of Nun. They told him all that had happened to them. They said to Joshua, Truly, Yahweh has delivered into our hands all the land. Furthermore, all the inhabitants of the land melt away before us. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Dan Louis. So, let's start off there in verse 1. That... Joshua sends two men out of Shittim as spies to view the land in Jericho. Well, they had sent, 38 years before, they had sent out 12 spies to spy out the land. And 10 spies came back and said, we can't take the land. This land is full of giants. It's very strong people. They live in cities with massive walls. Our hearts melted for fear. Let's go back to Egypt. Joshua and Caleb said, no, 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 we can take this land. <clears throat> no problem. It's a very good land. And so because they, the people believed the 10 spies, they had to wander in the wilderness till that generation died and they couldn't go into the land. So was it a good idea to send out spies again? Well, I wonder if that's why he sends them secretly, because he wants that human assurance He's trying to make a strategy. He sees this great big city, Jericho, with these massive walls all around it. Let's send two spies into the city to see how we might be able to take it. Well, you know, God didn't use that at all. <clears throat> Actually, they went out there and came back with no information that could be used for the military strategy. God's plan, of course, was not any kind of humanly very smart strategy. Uh, it was that the whole people... Uh, tramped around the city uh, once a day for six days and on the seventh day they walked around it seven times till they were exhausted blew with the trumpets and whoops the, the walls fell down by a miracle so actually they don't contribute anything to the battle plan to take Jericho and although it's not quite apparent in the English he says in verse 1 go and view the land so they went now went is the past tense of the verb to go literally they goed and did they view the land did they reconnoiter well no they all they did was go into uh, the house of a prostitute and escape down the wall 
So it's uh, sort of reads in Hebrew a bit sort of like an anti-climax. Go and spy out the land. They goed, they went, uh, yeah, well, all they did was see the house of a prostitute and, and escape. And so a little lesson there that, that, you know, trusting in your own strength, this is always what man wants to do. And God's got a far bigger picture of how he behaves and how he does things. And our style is to try and work it all out ourselves. And God's got this huge picture that's bigger than that. Well, to try to reconstruct what actually happened, they came into the city. The city's walled. You can only get in through the gate. And there's houses on the wall, including Rahab's. So they walk into the city in the evening. <clears throat> See, they they entered into the city uh, at the, at the evening, and you know the sunset is fairly fairly fast in. Uh, in the Middle East and Israel. So they come into the city <clears throat> and the gates are shut. But they are <clears throat> there uh, immediately, I suppose, noticeable as being foreigners. I mean, there was the Israelite army camped uh, fairly close to them. The people are scared stiff. The Israelites are going to attack them. And, well, they're looking out for spies. And these two guys walk in. They are... Uh, two men, it says, but the Hebrew says young men, and the Septuagint says two youths. They were very young men. And they'd have been dressed differently. They'd been in the wilderness for you know, 38 years. They may have spoken a language that was understandable, but it would have been with a very different accent. It was immediately obvious that they were foreigners. So these two guys walk into a walled city, that evening, as the sun's going down, the door is shut, the gate is shut. Oh, hang, what are we going to do? We are trapped. We're trapped. And so, oh, let's go into this uh, this house, or this, this brothel, we go in there. And, you know, ding dong, there's a knock at the door, and Rahab opens, and, oh, she sees straight away who they are. Now, she, as you can see from what she later says, knows the history of Israel very well. She talks about Yahweh. She has come to believe in this one true God. She quotes a number of things from the Song of Moses. That was the song they sung in triumph after they had crossed the Red Sea. And she thinks, wow, this is my chance to connect with the God of Israel. But they couldn't have been there very long. Uh, before there's another knock at the door, and of course it's the uh, the police, as it were, the king's men from Jericho. Where are those two men who came into you? And she hides them under the flax, the stalks of flax on her roof, and she lies. She says, uh, "You ask me, you know, two men came into my place. Yes, they did. You ask me their names. You ask me who they are, where they came from. Uh, I'm a whore. I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't know." I, I have no idea. I'm a whore. I don't know. ask my clients their names or they, where they are, where, where they came from. Uh, I'm my business. So, in a rather, I think, <laughs> beautiful in between the commas kind of way, uh, God uses this woman so that she's the only woman in the whole city who can say, yes, I did have two, uh, two men. Uh, you say, are they Hebrews, Israelites? Oh, it might have been. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. And of course she lies and she says, oh, look, they, they went out over there. Um, you could outrun them. And she's implying, you strapping young men of Jericho, you're, you're stronger than those uh, fellows who came in to me just now. Uh, you, <laughs> you're very strong, aren't you? Fine young fellows, you are. Outrun them. This is, you know, female sort of, um, you know, uh, whatever with 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 males, and uh, she is deceitful all the way through, and yet that is quoted in the book of James in the New Testament as a sign of her having faith and justifying it by her works. She believed, and she showed her faith by her works in that she lied to save the lives of the spies, and she hit them, and let them down through her window, by the, the scarlet cord. 
so of course it's not okay to be a prostitute of course this was wrong but the whole point is that she believed the message why do i say that from hebrews eleven thirty one, we are told that rahab is an example of faith and the spies there are called the messengers the messengers now sometimes words have two meanings in Hebrew, spy and messenger are connected. In actually, it's the same in Russian, in classical Russian anyway. So <laughs> these people, these spies had a message which she believed. And we are told that she received the spies in peace. She believed their message. She had peace as a result of it and did works as a result of that peace with God that she felt, the works were the hiding of the spies. The works were the lying to the men of Jericho. That, yeah, these guys came, but they're gone. I don't know. Chase after them. Go over there. You might catch them. So this was all done as the sun was going down. As I say, the, the sun, uh, sunset comes quickly in the Middle East, in Israel, Jericho, let's say. So the amount of time involved was short. These guys entered the city. Oh, hang, the, the gates shut. We are now trapped in a walled city. We can't get out. Let's go to a brothel. Uh, which was kind of, I suppose you could say, smart thinking to a certain extent. Um, and straight away, she, this prostitute, who has all this knowledge about the God of Israel, presumably picked up from her clients uh she had heard uh, about all this about the history of israel crossing the red sea what had been said in the song of moses how they had destroyed other nations on their way to jericho she knows all this uh, presumably from her clients uh, who had were travelers who had told her the story and she believed all this and desperately would have loved to be part of the of the the hope of Israel, of the people of Israel. And there she is, knowing that I'm an Ammonite woman, I'm condemned. And as she she says, you utterly destroyed, you utterly destroyed other nations. And she's again quoting from words of Moses, God's words through Moses, where he says, You are to utterly destroy these nations. Do not make a covenant with them. Just destroy them. Well, she's thinking like, well, here I am in this closed city. I'm a whore. And I desperately want to be part of God's purpose with this God of Israel. But I'm, I'm morally a sinner. Plus, God has said he's going to destroy uh, this city. And there's no way to make a covenant. We are just doomed for destruction. Very similar to us, actually. The wages of sin is death. We have sinned. So that's it. Uh, but God knows his people. And love finds a way. And grace finds a way. And there's a knock on the door. Oh, a couple of clients, a couple of fellows. Oh, hey, these guys are, are Hebrews. They're spies. Quick, come in. The time that, the, the contact time that they must have had before she hid them on the roof was very short. I wouldn't have said it was half an hour. I really would not have said it was half an hour. We're told in James that she believed the message. You put Hebrews and James together. She believed the message, and then she did works. And what were her works? After, after she had believed, her works were to hide the spies. After she had heard their message, and as Hebrews 11 says, and she did not perish with the rest of them who did not believe. Well, I, I can't, because of the whole thing about the sun going down, I can see that this, this was more than half an hour. An hour, if you, if you wish. No, no, I don't think it could have been that. She heard this basic message. She believed it. And she did some, she had peace. She had peace. We're told she received the messengers with peace, and then she did some works to show her faith. She hid them. 
you see there the power of the basic gospel message, the gospel of the kingdom, as it was in its very primitive form, but all the same. And she got it in half an hour and believed it and had peace that I'm now going to be okay. And so she does some works. She hides the spies and ding dong, where are those guys? She lies through her teeth, actually, to, to save them. Now, you and me know far more of the gospel than she does, far more. If that's what it, how it was for her, and it motivated her to that extent, how much more should it motivate us? How much more? Uh, you know, when, when people say, oh, you know, no, no, you, you've got to go through six months of instruction. When I baptized a guy um, earlier this week, um, who had been on Zoom meetings for 22 months. 22 months. And they're still telling him, oh, you've got to come to the church, you've got to come to the ecclesia. Well, he couldn't get there for various reasons. Um, <laughs> come on. <laughs> this is not right. This is totally wrong. The basic gospel is simple. I keep saying a child could understand it. Mm, absolutely correct. A child can understand it. Why not? Um, of course, it goes so much deeper, and I accept that she did have a fair bit of background knowledge about the God of Israel. I, I accept that. But the, the simple message was believed by her to the point that she felt peace, and then she did some works. She lied about the spies, and she hit them under the stalks of flax. Well, that's one take, and I'm going to offer you a slightly other take on, on it as we go through. I want to say at this point about the two spies that were sent out. When they sent the spies out before, they sent 12 spies, and two spies came back faithful. They were Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb were from the tribes of Ephraim and Judah. And so I suggest that these two guys who were sent out were also perhaps from the tribes of Ephraim and Judah. When you come to the genealogy of the Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, you read that Rahab was in his line. She was one of his ancestors. And that she had a child <clears throat> who later went on through Obed, Boaz, Obed, Jesse, David, etc., uh, by a prince of the tribe of Judah called Salmon. And so is speculation, but I do wonder whether these two spies would have been likewise from Ephraim and Judah, the two tribes whose spies have been faithful first time. And, well, she has a child by a prince of the tribe of Judah. Well, you can join the dots and see what you see. But, uh, by the way, you, when you look at the genealogy of the Lord Jesus, you see so many odd people, Rahab, Tamar, two women who were prostitutes, uh, etc. So you see there uh, that you, you know, he was perfect, right? And yet, in his past, there were all sorts of uh, strange situations. So don't blame your weakness on... Oh, bad background, bad genetics. Oh, my father was an alcoholic. My grandmother was an alcoholic. Yeah, this is what I see here all the time. I run the soup kitchen in Riga. Oh, it's genetic. So it's not genetic. I understand what you're saying. Yes, you bad background going back generations, I don't doubt. But you can rise above. Look at the genealogy of the Lord Jesus. Plenty of, plenty of wild people there. Rahab had a child by a prince of the tribe of Judah. That's what she did. And yet, did she have any other children? It seems no, because we've read the uh, we've read the story, and well, it's not a story, I mean, it, it happened, but you know what I mean. We've read the account, and she makes a deal with these spies, and she says, will you save my family? They say, yes, we will if they come into your house when we return and you put the scarlet cord outside your house, then we'll come to your house and we'll save your family. 
And we're told in Joshua 6 that, yes, this is what happened. And they brought out of Rahab's house her and her sister's brothers and parents. There's no mention of her husband and no mention of other children. She didn't have children, it seems, because the people that are saved from her house it, it, are not her children. They are her parents and her brothers, sisters, and, uh, and their families. So you scratch your head and you think, well, she was a prostitute. Well, why do people become prostitutes? Well, I know it's a bit sordid to think about it, but it, it's, you know, it's a reality of life. And nearly everybody that I've been associated with who I know does that sort of thing, it does it for a reason and not because they particularly get a kick out of doing it. I suggest that she was a barren woman who couldn't have children. And so her husband had divorced her, just ignored her. And so how was she supposed to live? She had no man in her life. This is why it's Rahab's house. Houses usually belong to a male. But she's got her own place, shall we say. Well, yeah, because she was barren. And what did barren women, barren divorced women do? Well, they became prostitutes. And of course, this uh, made their job to some degree easier uh, because if they couldn't get pregnant, well, there was no problem with contraception and so forth. So yeah, she it all, you know, the dots add up and you see the picture that she was a barren woman, um, divorced, I assume, uh, who therefore had to work as a prostitute. And of course, her family didn't want to know her because they don't live in her house. She has to invite them into her house to be saved. They, uh, I guess, disowned her or didn't want to know about her. They were ashamed because of her. Yeah. And it was this woman who, despite her immoral life, that I would say she was driven to, who has this great passionate interest in the God of Israel and the hope of Israel and wants to become part of it. But how can I? I'm a whore and I'm in a, a closed city that God has said this is to be destroyed. These people are be, to be destroyed. You are not to make peace with them. No covenants, no mercy, no grace. That's it. They've got to be wiped out. But I want to. I want just my you know, fantasy is to be part of the people of God. And there's two Israelite guys knock on your door. So God knows his people. There is no position that is so hemmed in, that is so impossible that God can't use you. And the story of Rahab finishes in Joshua 6 by saying that she dwells in the midst of Israel unto this day. She who was the absolute outsider, total outsider, who couldn't be saved, was brought right into the midst of Israel and becomes the wife, it seems, of a prince of the tribe of Judah, and despite being barren, she has a child, and that child becomes an ancestor of the Lord Jesus. I mean, what an amazing story. And we worry about how obscure we are, or we lament that the ties that bind are too, too strong, be it poverty, be it family situation, be it lack of a church, to go to, be it whatever it might be, be it your own sinfulness, be it the consequences of bad decisions in the past and weakness of the present. You know, she could have quit the job, I believe so. But she didn't, for whatever reason. And even <laughs> she could be brought from that position into the midst of Israel. And that is the encouragement for all of us. And also to, to not, you know, despise people who are apparently stuck in a situation. People say, well, we can't fellowship with so-and-so because she's living in sin. Just means she hasn't got a marriage certificate. I oh, get real. Look at all these examples of people who have been right in, in these very difficult situations who were saved. Now, going through the record you see that this is an allusion to Passover. She hides them under the uh, stalks of flax. And this would have been the time of harvest. I'm actually told 
um, in chapter three that it was the time of harvest, and I assume it was barley harvest, because a wheat harvest would have been uh, what would have been at Pentecost um, seven weeks later. But uh, so this is Passover time. The Jordan is flooded. Jordan River is, is a stream, really, um, but at springtime. It's huge. It's wide because of all the snow melt up in the Hermon Mountains up there in Lebanon. It all melts and it all comes down and the river expands hugely. And we are told that the river was wide and hard to cross at this time. So it's Passover time. And the spies say, look, we will save you. But you have got to get your family inside the house, your house. And if anyone goes out of the house, we won't save them. They will die. It's exactly from the Passover. And then they say, you've got to put this red scarlet cord in your window. This is the equivalent of painting the blood on the lintels. This is her little Passover. But you see, it's, it's in essence, there was no shedding of blood. It was just a scarlet cord that was used, the color of blood in her window, not on a door, but in the window. Well, you see there how God is not a literalist. He doesn't say, oh, I'm going to keep the Passover. It's got to be the shedding of blood, etc." It's the essence of it that mattered. And she had heard about the Passover deliverance. She says that. And yet she is now given her chance for her little Passover deliverance. And as you go through the record, you can see this uh, hints at the Passover all, all the time. So then, <clears throat> verse 9, she said to the men, I know that Yahweh, and you see she uses the covenant name of God, I know that Yahweh has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. And when she says God has given you the land, this is right out of Deuteronomy, where Moses keeps on saying that, God has given you the land. And she says that the fear of you has fallen on us. This is the song of Moses, that the fear or the terror of God would fall upon the people of Canaan. And it's interesting that she says, we, verse 10, um, have heard all that you did, and etc. And verse eleven, and when we heard it, our hearts melted. But we're told that the Israelites, when they heard that there were cities in Canaan with walls, that their hearts melted. So you have this bizarre position where the Israelites, their hearts are melting because of the Canaanites, or the Canaanites' hearts are melting because of the Israelites. So those apparent barriers to you and me entering God's kingdom that might seem like walled cities. And they, these are not as great as they seem. People say, I can't be baptized because you don't know. I have this addiction. I have this weakness. I have this whatever. You know, none of these things are as massive as they seem. Well, she says, verse 10, we have heard how Yahweh dried up the waters of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites, whom you utterly destroyed. Well, yeah, the utter destruction, we're told in uh, Numbers 21 and in Deuteronomy 3, was because Israel had prayed to God. We are, it specifically says that, Deuteronomy 3, but they prayed and therefore God utterly destroyed the two kings of the Amorites, Sihon and Og, because they prayed. So she's thinking, yeah, if you pray to this Yahweh God of Israel, he does amazing things. And there she was thinking, well, I'm a no-hoper, I'm a whore, I'm a sinner. Uh, plus, I'm one of the people who's got to be destroyed, there can be no covenant with me. But God, could you find a way? Ding dong, oh, it is this next climb. These, these, these guys are Israelites. And so the wonderful story works out. So she has got this very clear awareness of God and the Song of Moses, etc. And she, she says, uh, verse 11, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. This is Deuteronomy 4. Yahweh, he is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. She's quoting she was somehow aware 
of the words of Moses. Somehow she picked this up from her clients. I do not see how else she could have uh, picked it up. So she says, verse 12, Now therefore, swear to me by Yahweh, since I have dealt kindly with you, and this is chesed, which is pretty well, I think, the Hebrew equivalent of grace. Because I've dealt by grace with you, I mean, I could have just dobbed you in, guys, but I didn't. Will you also deal kindly, chesed, deal with grace, with my father's house, and give me a true token? Well, <clears throat> will you show me grace? She's saying, I'm condemned. And of course they do. They do. And this is the, this is the huge comfort that, yes, uh, she was saved by grace, but she asks for a token, for something visible, visual. And they basically, as I understand it, what was the true token? What was the token she wanted? The sign, they say, look, this scarlet cord, this scarlet rope, that's the token. And so we here take the wine, the symbol of the blood of the Lord, and that is our token. This is the symbol of the covenant. This is the comfort that, yes, we who are no hopers absolutely are saved. You will notice that there is no uh, raking into the fact that she's a prostitute. But I say, look here, are you, are you repentant? Where are your fruits for repentance? I'm sure she was repentant, but that is not actually gone into raking through people's private lives. No, it's of grace. And so she says, verse 13, please save alive my father, mother, brothers, and my sisters, and all that they have. Deliver our lives from death. As I say, no mention of any children. She was bound, seems to me. No mention of her ex. So for them to be saved, they had to come into her house. You know, many years we ran the soup kitchen in Riga. I used to baptize all sorts of people, including prostitutes, full-blown prostitutes. And I do remember the one, well, I also baptized her mother some years later. And I got some insight into how family members think about their the daughter uh, who's a prostitute. And of course, as you can imagine, there is a distance there. There is a shame. There is a disowning. There is a degree of separation. Understandably. But to be saved, they had to get over that and come into the brothel, into Rahab's house. And I think you see there that reconciliation, to some degree, between persons is related to salvation if you like, our sort of vertical connection with God has got to be reflected in your horizontal relationship with your brothers and sisters. And if you just say, no, 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 that's it. She's a whore. Uh, no, I'm not going in there. Okay, fine. So you won't be saved. There's was a choice. Believe or you know, reconcile or perish was pretty well what was being said here. And she, of course, preached in that sense the gospel to them because they would have only come in to her house if they believed the message. And that's why Hebrews 11 says that she believed and did not perish with those who did not believe. Well, that makes the people of Jericho those who did not believe. And so you wonder, well, on what basis did they not believe? They were you know, written down for condemnation. On what basis did they not believe? Because they didn't believe her preaching. She preached. It's quite amazing, absolutely amazing. So, 15, she let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was on the side of the wall, and she lived on the wall. Two other people escaped out of windows by cords. David, when he was being chased by Saul, and Paul, or Saul, when he's let down over the wall of Damascus. And you think, what are the similarities between those three cases, Rahab, David, and, and Paul? Well, without going into it, just on the simplest level, you see that God works according to some sort of structure and some sort of plan all over the millennia. 
And this is why Paul talks about patience and comfort of the scriptures, and that thereby we might have hope, that your situation is not, in fact, unique. We all think that my situation is unique. Nobody would be able to relate to my situation. Nobody would get it. No one went through what I went through. Well, yes, that's how it seems. Until you start inter interacting with other believers and you find that the situation that you thought was totally unique to you is not, in fact, was not, in fact, totally unique to you at all. So if you go to church and just talk about the weather and the state of the nation and the pathetic government we got and all, you know, all the sort of stuff people talk about, no, talk about spiritual things and your, your walk with the Lord and you will find that other people have gone through the essence of what you've gone through and that is the basis of Christian fellowship. So, verse 18, when we come into the land, you shall bind this line of scarlet thread in the window. The cord of this crimson thread, I think the idea is that the rope was the crimson thread. The rope was red that they were let down by. I think that's what the Hebrew implies. That's what it's saying. Well, you know hairdressers, barbers, right? They've got that pole, that revolving pole, right? So you say, oh, that's a barber shop. It's a trade sign. Chemists, the same. They got their little sign, their trade sign. And going back centuries, probably more. Well, prostitutes have, as the world's oldest profession, have always had something red on their house. Red light districts. Don't know, red light district, it's all red. It's not green, is it? It's not yellow, it's red. Okay, so I would take the red uh, scarlet rope as the sign of a prostitute's house and so they are saying when we come back we want you to display this cord again in your window which could imply that yeah you've got to take it down you're not going to be a prostitute are you whilst you are waiting for us to come and save you so you know it's not okay to be a prostitute in, in that sense and so the symbol of her sordid, immoral business actually became the path of salvation for the spies. Well, this uh, sort of connection becomes, I think, a bit more actual when you read stories of brothels on walls. And there was a number of these stories in the old Babylonian legends, uh, Canaanite legends, where the uh, clients, shall we call them, used to exit the brothel on a scarlet rope. So that rope, the symbol of very shameful, sordid, shameful behaviour, really, became the symbol of the blood of Christ, the equivalent of the Passover lamb's blood painted on the lintels and doorposts. And it became the path to salvation in the same way as her telling a lie became the basis of her salvation. Now, telling lies is wrong. If you isolate the lie that she told, a lie is a lie. It's wrong. But you see how God works through the worst of human sin. So when God encounters sin, he does not turn away in disgust. He is hurt. He is angry. There's such a thing as the wrath of God. Uh, but he works through it, and that is my point. It's the same with the cross. Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. It was the symbol of shame, of torture, of failure. And that is why, as Paul says to the Corinthians, the cross is a stumbling block to both the Jews and the Gentiles. And yet in him, in his purpose, in the Lord's purpose, it becomes the symbol of triumph and of salvation. So I think that is comfort to us 
in our obscurity, in our sinfulness, that God can work something beautiful out of that. And I think likewise, when you encounter people who are clearly living in modern lives, hardcore heroin addicts who turn up at your lunchtime church, prostitutes and so forth, yeah, you don't turn away. You don't say, this is a church. No. It's exactly because the religion and churchianity has done that, that masses of people don't come to Jesus Christ. Well, working through this idea that, you know, what I mean, Rahab actually told a whole load of lies and did a whole load of deception. And that was wrong of itself, but God worked through it. And likewise, the scarlet thread, the scarlet cord becomes the symbol and the path to salvation. I want to, at this point, make a suggestion that I, uh, I hesitate to make uh, because... I can't quite prove it, but I'll share it with you and you see what you make of it. If you go back to verse one, you read there that these two young men, young men, one of whom I suggest actually at some point does sleep with Rahab and produces a child who becomes an ancestor of Jesus. These young men were sent out. Uh, go view the land, but they go, same word, went, they go, and, well, they came into the house of a prostitute. As I say, it's a sort of um, anticlimax. Go and do reconnaissance. Well, they go and, they came in, go into the house of a prostitute. Go and, well, they, they goed, they went, they go and go into the house of a prostitute. They're supposed to go and view the land. And they slept there. Well, I very much doubt they slept a week that night, uh, physical sleep. And this a number of years ago, I noticed that this word slept there. This is the word for sleeping with a woman, sex. And I just put that in the back of my head. And I, I just wondered why it would say that. Because if the idea is, well, they spent the night there, there's Hebrew terms that could be used for that. And so I wonder, and this is just me wondering, whether these guys, who are young men, they come into Jericho, and contrary to the scenario that I painted at the start, they think, oh, don't forget, they were terribly naive. They'd only been in the community of Israel living in the desert all those years with no prostitution, no brothels or whatever, living under the law of Moses. They come into this Gentile city of 38 years they, you know, in all their lifetime. They were born in the wilderness. They were desert kids. Wow, this is a brothel. Should we just go in here? Oh, where's the Madame? Oh, there she is. You guys, Israelites. I am sort of led to that uh, also by my own experience. Um, I have never used a prostitute, and what I'm going to say is not at all an indirect admission of personal guilt. Uh, I find the whole thing sordid, and no, that's not my... I sin, of course, so I'm not a sinner, but... That sort of thing now, it's not, not my kind of sin, um, I can truly say. Um, I have known and seen missionaries, missionaries using prostitutes on mission trips. Twice I saw this in different countries. It happened. I'm aware it happened. And... I'm also aware of a lot of sexual misbehavior that goes on by missionaries. And you wonder where the term missionary position comes from. Well, think about that one. And yeah, you understand it. These people grow up in, in very tight communities, grow up, mum and dad are in the church. They grow up, they join the church. They become you know, the young missionaries. And they go out to some foreign land. Oh, no one's looking over my shoulder. I could do what I want. No one's going to know. No one's here in the middle of Africa or the middle of wherever it might be. Timbuktu. Oh, no one's going to know, are they? And psychologically and circumstantially, it would make a lot of sense, the suggestion I've made. 
make a lot of sense. That they, it's a bit like sometimes you, you see folks from Iran or Afghanistan, they, if they suddenly come to the UK, for example, fresh from, say, Iran or Afghanistan, their eyes are on stalks. Wow, there's all these scantily dressed women. Oh, wow, you can drink alcohol where you want. There's pubs, there's nightclubs, and war. You know, you notice it. Uh, that's understandable. I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying it's psychologically understandable. And that is my, well, I'm not saying that's what happened, but I, I wonder, I wonder. When we were young men, youths, we're told in the subcurrent. And, I, and one of them does end up getting, as I suggested, I think, getting Rahab pregnant and the child becomes the ancestor of David and the Lord Jesus. That would fit the whole sort of feeling in this uh, in this story that, well, God works through weakness. God works through human failure. I mean, Rahab didn't have to be a prostitute, right? Well, even if she was barren and had been divorced, there was other ways she could have made ends meet, just about. Could have been a beggar, for example. Didn't want to be. And so, yeah, sin is sin, but it is not the ultimate barrier. God can work through it, and he does. So she ties the, uh, the cord in the window, and it seems to me risked her life by preaching uh, to other people. And she did manage to persuade some of her family to come into her house and be saved so the spies had said oh sorry she had said give me a token give me a guarantee well the token was you put your scarlet cord that designates your house as a brothel you put it in the window yeah open for business yeah <laughs> but understanding it differently and so we want a token don't we we want something physical because we're human, like she was. And God doesn't give us very much. God is not a God of ritual. But he has given us the breaking of bread. He has given us baptism and the breaking of bread, as I see it, as the only kind of visible, visual kind of rituals, the tokenism, the physical tokenism um, in, in, in our lives. And, you know, we take the, the bread and the cup with, with both hands. The these things do represent the amazing reality that we obscure people apparently trapped by the ties that bind, trapped by our own sinfulness, trapped as we feel by situations, you know, and allowing situational ethic to lead us to behavior that, that is not worthy of us, as happened with, with Rahab. Okay, God sees all that, but he saw her heart. That could it be that I please somehow i have no idea how it could be part of you and your purpose and your people and the prayer seemed to go unanswered until there's a knock at the door and there's two clients and there out of left field is your path right up. it's wonderful you know it is wonderful so let's let's thank god for for the bread which is the symbol of the lord's body um let's uh let, let's give thanks for that um <clears throat> i don't know who would like to give thanks for the uh for the bread um uh, mark would you like to give thanks for the bread certainly lord god our heavenly father we come to you now with absolute gratefulness and thankfulness in our heart for the Lord Jesus Christ <clears throat> for what was is considered in the world as something shameful something so silly and stupid for a righteous man to give his life on the cross for sinners like us what we see as other people calling shameful we see as your power and your wisdom 
to transform lives and to bring us into covenant with you. We have no doubt, Heavenly Father, as to the fact that we can put our faith and trust in you because you did give your only begotten Son on the cross so that we might take hold of those promises which you by grace have brought our way. This is what we remember in our Lord Jesus Christ as we take this bread, that he has been a power in our life, thanks to you, and he has been your wisdom to us also, bringing us into repentance and also bringing us into thankfulness for your grace and mercy. So this is the symbol of his body, which was given for us. So let's take the uh, take the cup. And I wonder, um, Dan Louis, could you uh, give thanks for the year for the cup? Yeah. Yeah, give thanks for the cup. Our dearest Father in heaven, again and again, our hearts and our, our lives are being touched. No matter how many times we hear about your grace and the marvelous work of your salvation, it never gets old, and that is the wonder of you. For your promises and your words keep us alive and renewed. Father, we are here today celebrating Jesus, our Lord, and freedom in him through his blood, taking this cup of blessing to remind ourselves of your magnificent salvation and your promises all came true in your son. Help us, Father, to truly feel and to have a deep sense of, of your amazing love and to see the beauty of your message of true hope in your kingdom. Thank you, Father, for opening the way to us through your son. Please help us to stay true to you and your son to the end and letting your spirit continue the work in us, transforming us and preparing us entering into your kingdom in the glory of your name, above all and in all, in Jesus. Amen. Um, well, John, would you like to conclude with a prayer? Yes. Um, dear Lord, we thank you for this chance to come together again to worship you and also to remember what your son had done for us and also the loving plan of salvation which you have in mind for us and we also pray that um you, you will be with each and every one of us as we go through our daily lives and also as we keep meeting up and as we strengthen our faith in you, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you.